Hi everyone and welcome to today's educational webinar brought to you by Physician Partners and the Physician Resource Center. Um, again, as always, all participants are muted throughout the entire webinar just to reduce any background noise or, or interruptions. Uh, please feel free to type in questions at the end of the webinar and we'll answer them um, as they come through. Uh, today's topic is uh, where are the PPO patients and how do I get them into my practice? Uh, we have a few different uh, presenters today. I'll introduce Bill Ross first. Uh, Bill Ross is the Executive Director of the South Bay Independent Physicians Medical Group. It's a 450 plus multi-specialty physician provider member organization located in the South Bay area of Los Angeles, covering over 5,000 employers, encompassing 1.5 million covered lives. Currently, Mr. Ross also serves as a board member and Executive Director of First Choice Administrators, the California Licensed Third Party TPA. Um, also today we'll have uh, Natalie Nelson. Um, Natalie Nelson is our physician services. services manager. Thank you, Natalie. And also myself, Dustin Brown, I'm the business development director here at Physician Partners. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Mr. Ross, thank you for uh, being one of our uh, presenters today. Glad to do it. All right. The uh, Topic, where are the PPO patients? As you can see from the slide, at least 50% of the commercial patients out there are in PPOs of one type or another. Obviously, a, a significant share in what we call the BUCAs, that's the Blues, United Health, Cigna, and Aetna. Uh, there's a significant share in self-insured. This is the crowd that uh, typically works with organizations like mine and physician partners. They're, they're using TPAs, administrative service organizations, some of which are insurance companies, uh, to administer their plans or actually to pay the claims for them. And they access a lot of the independent PPOs. And of course, there are the major independent PPOs that there's some more information coming up shortly about those. But a lot of these patients uh, that are in the BUCAs may have access secondarily to some of the independent PPOs as well. So it gets a little confusing. We'll go into some of that later as well. On the next slide, uh, where are the patients at? There's information for Scripps Mercy Physician Partners where you see for First Health and Multiplan, for example, the number of clients that they have down in the San Diego area and just some of the names of the ones that you can recognize there locally. But these are, Multiplan and First Health are two of the largest national players in the independent PPO market. So they're not insurance companies, they are independent PPOs. They do, however, work with most of the major insurers, with the exception of uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield. But they work with United, they work with Cigna, they work with Aetna and many of the ins other insurance companies. Of course, they work with almost all of the third-party administrators out there. And the reason they work with the insurers is that Cigna and Aetna, for example, do a lot of work in what they call ASO, administrative services only, which is similar to a TPA. It's just a different name, but the insurers typically call themselves ASOs rather than TPAs. So they have a lot of different contracts with all of these independent PPOs. And a lot of the other ones you may recognize, uh, Beach Street, Private Healthcare Systems, uh, HealthSmart, uh, Interplan, all of those are also active in the independent PPO market. So the question then comes in with all these different patients out there, how do I recognize a PPO patient and, and under which particular PPO program do they come from? So on the next slide, Excuse me. The next slide, we want to talk about a little more of the nitty gritties of how to really identify these folks. If you look at um, the ID card when the patient first comes in, typically every office makes a copy of that ID card and that does go into the patient's file. It also goes over to the biller. The breakdown happens usually at that point. Uh, most billers when they take the information off the ID card, they put into the financial management system the name of the payer. So that might be an insurance company, it might be an employer, it might be put in as a TPA uh, or some other union or, or other organization. They'll put that into the financial management system along with the address and contact information for that payer. Most billers, however, don't put in the PPO information. And this is why most practices can't identify their PPO patients because frankly, the data is not in their system. So the real, the real problem comes in right there. And many of the older 
billing systems, frankly, don't even have a place to put in the PPO information. The reason it's so important, though, is that when you get paid on that claim, the payment amount is directly related to the PPO contract for which they're claiming the patient comes from. So, for example, if the patient comes in and is a Beach Street patient and it has Beach Street on the ID card, if you don't put Beach Street in your financial management system for that patient, you don't know what you're supposed to get paid on that claim because there's no way to track it. So when an EOB comes in, first off, you don't know if they've, if they've even collected the right PPO on the EOB, if they put the right PPO name on the EOB, and we'll talk about that in a second. And then secondarily, even if they had the right PPO on the EOB, you don't know if they paid you the correct amount because you, you don't know that that was a Beach Street patient. So it's critical that all of your billers immediately start putting in for these patients as they come in, not only the payer name and the payer identification information, but the PPO name. Now, to do this, if you're in one of those systems that doesn't allow the PPO to have its own field, there is still a way to do that. What we recommend is putting in the payer name with a hyphen to the PPO. And the reason is that many payers do use multiple PPOs. So, for example, EBAM, E-B-A-M is a TPA. And EBAM may work with Beach Street. They may work with PHCS. They may work with First Health. They may work with Multiplan. So in your payer system, you'll have an EBAN hyphen First Health, EBAN hyphen Beach Street, EBAN hyphen PHCS. Okay, so you get the idea. That way, you'll be able to tell exactly where those patients are coming from. Your biller can now audit the claims and tell if you're being paid correctly. So that's a, the matching the EOB to the ID card then when the EOB comes in is mandatory. Under California law, the payers have to put on the EOB the name of the PPO they used for the contract. And again, here's another area where many physicians and offices are losing money because that information can't be audited given the current financial system. So when an EOB comes in, if the EOB says that the patient is Beach Street, and you look at the ID card, you look at what's in the system, and that patient actually had, say, First Health on their card. What just happened is that that payer just pulled a silent PPO on you and cherry-picked a lower rate. And they found that since they had a contract with Beach Street and a contract with First Health, and First Health and Beach Street both had a contract with you as the physician, they took the lower of the two rates and they paid that and then said that the patient's there under the Beach Street PPO, even though the patient ID card says First Health. So that entitles you to go back then under your contract through physician partners to go back to the payer and say, no, this was a First Health patient. You need to pay the First Health rate. You're, you're paying this claim inappropriately. And your biller can now do that where before, without that information, they couldn't. The second level of checking with the EOB is that once you've established that the PPO is correct, say that they did put First Health on the EOB, now you need to check and make sure that they actually paid you correctly. You don't have to do this on every single claim, and the newer systems, frankly, do an automatic audit for you, so you can put your fee schedule into your system that you can get from Scripps Mercy, and the system can then check and make sure that for that CPT code, you were paid the correct amount of money. And if you weren't paid correctly, again, you can go back and say, wait a minute, I'm under physician partners, and I should have been paid X, and you paid me Y. What this will also do, besides improving your, your cash flow and your collection rate, it will also show you if you have other contracts that are outstanding with that PPO through other organizations that you may have been part of in the past. And this is a very common problem for physicians in California. You may have been in the IPA before, or you may have been in multiple IPAs. You may have been in another group. You may have been in another city, in another town. These contracts don't get deleted. They get kept in these systems. And unless you're terminated from those contracts by the holder of the contract, the payer and the PPOs keep holding on to you. Another, again, another example. Say you were in an IPA at some point in time, and you decided to get out of the IPA. You terminated your relationship with the IPA. Unless that IPA sent a cancellation to each of their payers that contract with that IPA saying you are no longer part of the IPA and to remove you from the database, 
each of those payers probably still holds a copy of that contract and that fee schedule for you with them from that IPA. And the only way you'll find out that that exists is doing the audit that I was just talking about because if they've mispaid the claim and say underpaid you, and typically the IPAs do have PPO contract rates that are below the rates you're getting through physician partners. So if you see this lower rate and you call them and say, oh yeah, we've got this with contracted through XYZ IPA, you can then take steps to get that terminated in their system. And then that will then make sure that going forward, you get paid correctly on your claims. That's an important check and an important step, and I can't emphasize that too much. When we've worked with our physicians in getting this cleared up, and the whole process takes, frankly, about a year to do, to find all these invisible contracts, their revenues definitely went up. I mean, this can improve your bottom line by a good 10%, if not more. And we'll get into questions later if, if you have some. Okay, let's go on to the next, next topic. Um, we want to talk a little bit about the ACA. Uh, some people call it Obamacare, and what could happen with the PPO market. As you know, again, in, in covered California, uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield primarily are the two carriers that are in that statewide. There are other organizations in each particular market that are also in that, but Blue Cross and Blue Shield will have most of the PPO business. United, Cigna, and Aetna are not in covered California at this time, so they still have products outside. They have their own PPO and HMO products, and those are still available to you uh, outside covered California. And then inside covered California, you'll be working with, as I said, the Blues and some other folks. Uh, if ACA really works, and you know, who knows what's going to happen at this point in time. It could take another year or two for us to really figure out whether all of the, the financial arrangements and the calculations and everything are correct and whether this can fund itself and make itself work. But if it does work, and more and more folks are driven into covered California, for example, you've, you've heard the, the news lines recently, 900,000 Californians are going to lose their individual insurance policies because they don't comply with the essential benefits that are necessary or the mandated benefits under the uh, ACA. To participate in covered, covered California, one of the requirements of that was to for the blues, they had to terminate their individual policies as of December 31st that didn't match the benefit structure uh, uh, that was required by the ACA. This is not true, by the way, at the federal level. They, they give you one more year. If you renew your policy, for example, December 31st, you can keep it until December 31st, 2013. But in California, you can't. They changed the rules on us. Uh, so the blues have gone out, Blue Shield, uh, Blue Cross have gone out and terminated their individual policies that don't match the, the mandated benefits. So those folks are going to be forced into the exchange or forced into the open market to find policies. And the, the, for them, the question is going to be, you know, what's cheaper? I, I've seen estimates that about 300,000 of the 900,000 are probably eligible for some type of subsidy, which may dictate that they go to the exchange. But the others uh, aren't, and therefore you know, we're not sure where they're going to end up. They could very well end up with Cigna and United or some other payer. But the, the blues do have the, uh, the edge as far as the exchange goes because they're the, the primary ones in there. So if this, if this ACA does really work and the government continues to force people into the ACA through various regulations like this one on the uh, termination of the individual policies, this could have a significant dampening effect on business using PPOs outside of the exchange, which could, of course, affect all of the business that comes through physician partners. If, however, the ACA doesn't work, then you know it's, it's kind of business as usual while we're waiting to see what, what shoe falls next. So it, it, uh, we probably won't have the same kind of impact if the, if the ACA does fail. But it could be significant if it does actually work. So we have to be careful of that. We'll kind of keep an eye on that. The other thing that could hurt PPO business in the future was done recently here in California. On the next slide. And that's stop loss legislation. Again, you know, many people are wondering what this possibly could do with PPOs, but if you look at the fact that most of the PPO patients are coming under the self-insured side of the house, uh, even if they're using insurance companies to do their claims or whatever, but the self-insured market is a significant market. It's, you know, it's at least 20% of the commercial side of the market. And so those folks, many of those are small businesses. And a small business here could be anywhere from 25 on up as far as the number of employees go. 
a law was just passed by Sacramento and signed by the governor October 1st that changed the minimum thresholds for insurance uh, from from whatever you want it. Basically, you could get a $5,000 policy in the marketplace, but now the minimum is going to be $35,000 for 2014, and by 2016, it'll go up to $40,000. And so what that means is a small business now has to take on that additional risk for every single one of their employees if they're going to go into a self-insured product here in California. As you might guess, uh, this legislation was sponsored by the insurance companies, particularly the Blues. And it was promoted, uh, again, by a number of different political forces up there in Sacramento as a way to keep people out of ERISA-exempt plans, which, of course, the state can't regulate, and force them into insured plans, which, of course, the state can regulate. So this has been done. Um, just so you know, the American Association of Preferred Provider Organizations was uh, adamantly opposed to this legislation. And, in fact, when it, the legislation was first proposed, the limit was $90,000. The APPO, in their lobbying efforts, was successful to get it down to this $35,000 and $40,000 level. But even with that, it's going to have a significant dampering effect on ERISA-exempt plans that do use these independent PPOs here in California when these thresholds go into effect. So it's going to become a real problem and a real issue for small businesses, so whether it's cost-effective or not, to be ERISA-exempt, where before it made sense now it may not, and uh, we're going to probably see more and more of that ERISA exam, at least the small business side, going into insured products, and again, they're going to be steered towards the exchanges, so that, that's another area where we're going to have some, uh, there's some concern, we're going to have to watch very carefully what's going on. So now that I've given you all the bad news, um, I'm going to turn it back over to Dustin to uh, follow up and hopefully with some good news. <laughs> well, thank you, Bill. It's, it's very detailed and uh, very insightful information. I'm, I'm going to actually uh, go to the next slide for, for Natalie Nelson to uh, shed some more light on. Um, yeah, thanks, Bill. That, that was very helpful. And, and as he noted, um, there's, there's, there are always things going on legislatively. It's a good idea to keep on top of that information. Um, we wanted to show you some of the positive benefits of uh, membership in Scripps Mercy Physician Partners. Um, this slide demonstrates how effective our contracts can be for a practice. We used, we did a study, we just took 99213, an average office visit for an established patient, and we looked at the average difference in, say, in uh, revenue between what you would get from a contract like uh, First Health or Multiplan or Cigna, those were the three we used, versus at, at what you were able to do on your own versus what we physician partners can do on your behalf. And the average difference positive difference was $24.32. At that rate, figuring that you saw one patient from one of these three plans once a week for 52 weeks, you would actually see a value, an increase of $1,264. Since your physician partner's dues are $1,250 for the year, this would actually be slightly over 100% return on your membership dues. Now, if you see five of these PPO patients, and again, keep in mind what Bill was saying earlier, you may not necessarily identify them as being associated with, say, First Health, because First Health has a number of clients um, who are actually the payers of the claims. But if you have five of these patients, you'll be able to see a return on investment of 500% um, if you were to just see five of these patients a week in your practice. And, you know, again, we use 52 weeks because that's how many weeks there are in a year. We realize that not all practices are open every single week of the year, but you get the idea. 
And if you were to see 10 patients a week, um, then the return on investment is 1,000%. So in other words, at the end of the year, if you were to see 10 patients from any of these three uh, uh, contracts through physician partners, you would realize a benefit of $12,000 plus, $12,646 um, to your practice. It's a significant difference and a significant value to your offices. So in terms of what are your PPO patients worth to the practice, that's a real easy to understand differential um, as long as you're in one of our contracts or, or uh, a member of Physician Partners and accessing these contracts. And just as a point of reference too, when we did this study, we didn't include a plan like Scripps Employee Health Plan, which you can only participate in through our organization or through one of the other Scripps affiliated IPAs. Um, so again, we just want to demonstrate how valuable membership and physician partners can be. And these PPO patients, the contracts that we have for these PPO patients represent a significant increase in your uh, bottom line revenue at the end of the year. So uh, we wanted to make sure you understood that. And Dustin uh, was scrolling back to show you um, a slide that, that listed some of the employers or payers under these large network uh, PPOs like First Health and MultiPlan. Cigna, in fact, is a payer, so you would see their name on your check. And, and again, I'm sure you're all familiar with how this works, but it's a good thing to keep in mind that if the patient is a beneficiary under one of these PPOs, like First Health or MultiPlan or Beach Street or Interplan Health Smart, um, that logo on the card is going to be your clue. And again, that refers back to what Bill was saying earlier. It's really important that you know when the patient comes in and that your billing company or your billers note that relationship between the, uh, the uh, PPO, the first health or multi-plan, for example, and the actual patient so that you can make sure that you're being reimbursed properly. Great. Thank you very much, Natalie. So from here, we'll segment into uh, the marketing side of things. And I wanted to start with a slide here of uh, Albert Einstein. Um, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And this, this kind of stems from if you change the process, you can change the outcomes. And so it, we've, we've realized how to define the PPO patient from what, uh, what Bill described and what Natalie was just mentioning. But you know, where I'd like to kind of go to is applying what we're going to call patient relationship management to your business. And this in, in the past has been referred to as customer development um, or, or client relationship management, but for the terms of our business, uh, calling it patient relationship management. So the best marketing always comes from word of mouth referrals and also a relationship of trust. So if you can build that rapport and that relationship with a PPO patient, that can lead to another one, another, another, and et cetera, et cetera. So having that, that continuous interaction and follow-up and, and really setting the, uh, the relationship as a long-term principle uh, could lead for, for word of mouth beyond um, what's, what's really recognized with just that one patient. Uh, keeping in touch with patients, but be sure to be segmented. So again, as as Bill pointed out in the beginning on how to identify who those patients are, within, within your database, which I'll kind of get into in a few other slides, uh, and how you track your patients, if you can separate them out, uh, you, can, you can start to create a different message to the patient. So for example, it could be by age or uh, specific insurance type or their medical history, uh, anything that really helps you differentiate how you want to communicate a message out to these PPO patients will be important. So my background is technology, and I, and I have seen where technology can, 
uh, cause more distraction or more interference from more work. But uh, I, I believe there's technology out there that uh, can can help a, a practice or a business uh, further develop um, the, their customers and, and, and keep them long term. Relationship man management tools are a fantastic way uh, to build the relationships and gain more referrals. Uh, as you'll see in the second bullet point there, by improving patient relations with one PPO patient, this again could lead to three to five more new PPO patient referrals just by targeting the message the right way. Uh, I pulled this uh, from Bain.com, which they have some uh, some stats that you can go on there and view for different industries. But you know, just adding a new piece of technology does not mean adding more work. It can reduce and it reduce work and can reduce cost. And I think that's a, a good thing to keep in mind when you're using the right technology the right way. Change is involved, however, when you're monitoring the right patients and sending them the right message, the benefits could just be extraordinary. So I'm going to go into some basic uh, tools and suggestions to get your pa uh, patient relationship management off the ground. There's a product that's uh, uh, by Intuit called Demand Force. And Demand Force it can help you manage all aspects of your business from the outside in and vice versa. Uh, social media, uh, referrals, automated communications, patient surveys, appointment confirmations, postcards, etc. These are all great ways if you target the message the right way to the right patients at the right times, uh, the, uh, the results can be absolutely fantastic. And I'm going to show just a little screenshot of uh, the bottom of an email here that came to me from uh, another um, uh, medical member in the community that uses the product. And I, when I first experienced this, I thought, you know, this is, this is great. Uh, they've sent me an appointment confirmation. Uh, they've asked me if I need to um, uh, up request a different appointment, if I want to update my preferences. But do I want to refer a friend and do I want to give them a review? And they've also got their social link there. I think this type of communication with patients really says, you know, on my own time, when I have a few seconds, I'd like to refer somebody or I'd like to give you that review. Uh, and, and these types of reviews go leaps and bounds. We're talking testimonials for your website. We're talking social media that really helps the ranking for uh, your website if you have one uh, on the Internet right now. Uh, but just being able to refine, again, the email, the message, the text, the phone call, whatever it may be, to the right patients at the right time. And then we also have another product that's for, uh, for our members so that we have some preferred pricing on, which is the Patient Reminder Program by Clientel. Uh, the first, the Manforce product I would refer to as a, as a much more robust solution. Uh, this I'd refer to as, as a simpler solution. Uh, as far as um, feature set and, and ability to uh, kind of get up and running. But you can manage every day basic outbound and inbound notifications. You can segment out who the PPO patients are. You can set the, uh, the uh, broadcast communications that will need to go out just to PPO patients of, again, certain age, uh, certain locations, certain um, uh, health types, et cetera. So uh, using tools to help you get more PPO patients than I think through technology is just a, a valuable part that can't be overlooked. And you know, this, this is something I, I think it's a myth and that this doesn't just apply to uh, healthcare and, and private practice. I think this applies across the board with any business, but without integrating um, anything with the existing system that you have, in this case a practice, practice management system or an EMR, uh, these tools will, will cause more work. And I, I believe that's really false for, for a number of reasons. One, um, if you can get a tool that will do things that your current practice management system or EMR will not do to help you develop those relationships with the patients further, um, that's, that's simplifying work. That's simplifying time. And it may require the download of a spreadsheet or a CSV file uh, to be uploaded to these tools I've just uh, shown you. But, but overall, it's going to cut down on the workload and give you an output uh, that would uh, previously may, may not have been seen. So um, I think that's something to keep in mind and, and, and looking at uh, integrations as being great to have, but not necessarily um, a must to do. So I know I went through a lot of information there real quickly. I just wanted to keep things on time for today. I'm going to go ahead and uh, move it on to questions. 
so let's see here. Uh, are there any questions that anybody would like to uh, to ask at this point? Again, everybody is muted, so you'll have to type it into the GoToWebinar interface, uh, and then we can answer them as they come in. Bill, do you have any other notes that you'd like to fill in as we're, uh, we're wrapping this up and waiting for some questions to arrive? Uh, the, if they're interested in the <clears throat> stop loss insurance, they can go to the California legislative website, which as I understand it will be available, a link on your website coming um, the 15th of this month, I think. Yeah, we'll be able to put those links up there in mid-November, that's correct. Yeah, it's Senate Bill 161, and it was signed uh, October 1st, 2013. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we do have a question that's arrived here. Um, ID cards, payer list or PPO listed con confused? I guess that was a confusing point. Okay, the, the ID card is what the patient carries, and that on the ID card it says that they have eligibility. It tells you who to call for checking verifying benefits, it tells who the payer is, where to send claims, but they also put the name and logo of the PPO that that patient has enrolled in. So in looking at that patient ID card, when you make that copy and give it to the biller, you, you've got to make sure that the biller inputs both the payer and the PPO name. Now the insurance lists and the PPO lists are, are different things, and you do get a list from uh, Scripps Mercy of the various PPOs that they have uh, under contract, and of course those PPOs work with many, many different payers, TPAs, insurers, and things like that, so it does get confusing, so you have to kind of keep track of, you know, who's who. That's why the payers can typically get away with silent PPO or cherry picking on their claims and pay you less than you deserve unless your system is set up to monitor it and to verify that for that patient with that insurance or with that TPA, they're in that particular PPO. I hope that helped. Yes, okay, yes, absolutely. Uh, we have another question that, again, Bill, that you may be able to uh, shed some light on there. Is there a way to solicit the patients within these PPOs? We don't seem to get many referrals from these PPO insurances. It, that is very, very difficult, and I think that the areas that you talked about earlier, Dustin, as far as identifying those patients and getting information to them for referrals to their friends, family, coworkers, is probably going to be key. The, many of these PPOs themselves, frankly, don't know who their patients are that are enrolled in their programs because they don't, they're not an HMO. They don't get assigned patients. They don't get lists of which patients have signed up with them. Right. So they, even the PPOs themselves don't really know who the patients are. They'll, they'll know in total how many patients they might have in a given market, but they won't know who the patients are. So the best way to do it is, is through the areas that you talked about in identifying your own patients and then working through those areas. Yeah, because it really seems like when you, when you can almost help mature that relationship, you get a couple things. You get the longevity uh, and, and the consistent trust of that patient working with you long term. And then B, uh, that PPO patient is, um, has a high likelihood of being surrounded by with other friends or, or, or people they know uh, that can now refer to you on that trust that you've built with the physician and vice versa. Yeah, and if they're employed, of course, their employer is using that PPO. That's why they have that card. So you can go back to the employer and market your services to that particular employer. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, There's another question that's come in about uh, the, the question is phrased, so the PPO defines the rates. That's not how it works. Um, actually, and Bill's organization is similar to ours in the way we operate in regards to establishing the reimbursement. The, our group, when you join as a member of Physician Partners, we ask you what your minimum acceptable reimbursement is for your top 10 CPT codes. We put that information in our computer. When we have a discussion with the health, or with the PPO, we may receive an offer for them, from them for reimbursement. We take that offer and we compare it against what all of our members have told us is their minimum acceptable reimbursement. Um, 
if the offer from the PPO meets that minimum acceptable reimbursement for at least 50% plus one of our members, then we go ahead and take it to our board. Our board approves the contract, and then we offer it to all of our members as an option. So ultimately, you and your individual offices can choose whether or not the reimbursement is acceptable. Um, and that's correct, it, it, but that's the rate I was referring to. That's the PPO contract rate. Right, exactly. What you, you can control, and again, this refers back to what Bill was talking about earlier, you can control what you're accepting as reimbursement by keeping on top of which PPO you're being paid, well, according to which PPO contract you're being paid, and making sure that it is the correct PPO contract so they're not applying some other rate to this particular patient's experience in your office. Right, um, and in fact, whoever sent that message in, you may want to double check and audit some of your claims because if you're getting paid something different than, than Physician Partners has for you with that PPO, then this game that I was talking about is being played with you. And so the rate that they should be paying is the one that Physician Partners has under their contract that you've participated in. Uh, an another question was uh, the rep webinar, yes, it is being recorded um, and, and you will be able to access it and play it for your uh, various off staff billers, et cetera. This will be um, added to our Physician Resource Center Learning Hub. That website's going live, um, as Bill and I were talking about just a moment ago in the middle of November. It's launching on the 14th and it's going completely live on the 15th of November. Uh, this uh, recording, as well as other webinars that have been done in the past, will be on there. Uh, you'll be able to view them directly off the site. Well, it seems like uh, if there's any other questions, we can take them real quickly, but we've, uh, we've gone just a little bit past our time. Uh, I'd like to just go ahead and thank Bill Ross for being uh, one of our guest presenter today. Thank you very much, Bill, for being on. My pleasure. Uh, and thank you, Natalie. And thank you, everybody that attended. Again, this will be available uh, for viewing on the website on the 15th. The slides for the presentation will be available for download uh, starting tomorrow. So a link will be emailed out to you for that. So uh, other than that, thank you very much, everybody, and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.